Then from 1 Thessalonians, reading from verse 1 to verse 10. Paul, Silvanus and Timothy. To the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We always give thanks to God for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers, constantly keeping in mind your work of faith and labour of love and perseverance of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of our God and Father. Knowing, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, his choice of you. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sakes. You also came, you also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word during great affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place the news of your faith toward God has gone out, so that we have no need to say anything. For they themselves report about us as to the kind of reception we had with you and how you turn to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, that is, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. Amen. Amen. Father God, um, we welcomed you today. <coughs> Father, we opened our hearts and our minds and our souls, Father, to you, the one true God, yes. through Jesus Christ, our Lord, and through the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Father, I pray a touch upon Paul now from yes. you to lead us in this word, mm -hmm. to learn more of you, to learn more of you, of what you want each and every one of us to do. So, Father, I pray a blessing upon Paul right now as he, as he uh, brings us this word. Blessing, Father, in your name. Amen. Thanks, Phil. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Welcome, everybody. Amen. Yeah. So, I decided I would... Um, do a new book, and I, I couldn't actually remember uh, whether I'd actually done Thessalonians before or not. So Tim and I went on an investigation to find out whether we did, uh, and, uh, and I haven't. So, um, but even though I preached on bits of it, so I thought it would be a good book to go through. Um, I don't know uh, whether you get to kind of this part of your life where you think like you need to cover it, you know, in order so it's recorded. I don't know, but uh, anyway, that's what I decided to do, and I think the law was. Uh, in me in that process. Um, so, uh, just to say that the date of the church was founded in AD 51. So, it's quite young, really. Uh, not too long before, uh, after Jesus had actually disappeared into the glory place. It was while Paul uh, is on his second missionary journey. So, he had one before. He's doing the second storm. And he's out there preaching the word, building churches. Now he taught them in Thessalonica for three weeks <clears throat> and then <clears throat> he hit a wall really because he started to get some hassle from the Jews. The Jews began to persecute him. So he had to leave because of the persecution of the Jews <coughs> upon him. Now he left the responsibility of the leadership after a few weeks to <laughs> just young Gathering of Christians, just they were just babies, you know, a gathered Christian community. 
They were babies in God. And he left the responsibility to manage church with it to these young Christians. You know, they had like no experience. A few weeks input into the Paul's teaching. And if you've ever been involved in any form of leadership, you know, just giving responsibility uh, to anything is difficult. But to give the responsibility of people's lives to a church, a leadership, it's an incredible responsibility he gave to them. And yet he was prepared to do that, partly because he had to leave, otherwise he would have lost his life. But partly because God had plans, because sometimes we have to jump in deep end, do you remember that one? In order to learn how to swim. you remember that? Can you all swim? <laughs> so he left the responsibility to this newly gathered Christian community to the oversight of an ex-pagan worshippers. They were worshippers of the Greek gods, of the Roman gods, of the Egyptian gods. They were worshippers of idols. And he left the responsibility of this management of church to these very young Christians. They were without support and ongoing spiritual covering. And yet God had plans for them. And he would use them and impact them in so many precious ways. Now Paul is writing this letter and the theme and the message through this letter is the message of eschatology, the end of the age, the second coming of Jesus Christ, the summing up of all things, however you wish to say it. Paul brings in, as it were, the revelation of what it will be like in the end of the age. And and in every end of every chapter, there's a reference to the end of the age. The message is clear. So Paul, Sarinus, and Timothy, and he says this starts his letter by saying, "We are writing this letter of instruction, and they're writing it as the foundational leaders of this gathered community. So they feel like they've got a bit of authority because they're the ones that told them." And you know, that's what discipleship is. It's telling someone else what well, they don't know, but they need to know what you know. And you only know because someone told you. And they only knew because someone told them. And we trace it right back to the boys, the, num the number of 11, the, the 11. We trace it right back to the boys. We only know because someone told us. And brothers and sisters, there are people in front of us who we need to tell. We need to be a witness to in order to be able to share what they don't know with them, what we know, because someone told us what we didn't know. <laughs> Why say something simply when you can say it confusingly? That's right. <laughs> well, because you'll remember them. So Paul is writing this letter uh, and he wants them to be impacted. And he says that we have the authority. We are of one heart and mind in this matter. And unity in leadership is essential to make progress. But uniformity isn't. See, unity is important, but uniformity isn't. We don't all have to agree that that's the best cake, that that's the best biscuit, that that's the best way to do it. We can have diversity in our perspectives. The kingdom of God is not about uniformity, it's about unity. The church of Jesus Christ will never be uniformly together. It's too diverse, and rightly so, because diversity and people is the reality of who we are. So get away from thinking that we all need to think the same, feel the same, and do the same. We don't. God has given us the uniqueness of our identity to be who you are. So be who you are. And don't be transformed by false perspectives on what you need to be. So uniformity is not where it's at. Because there is strength in diversity. Do you want to say that? I just want to make sure you're still awake, that was it. 
So a bad leadership is when the main leader won't let the supporting elders input <coughs> into the vision and direction of the church. Or when the supporting elders, leaders, stifle the main leader. Because both will be negative. So as to not allow his visionary or her visionary gifting to express themselves. God blesses unity and oneness of heart. And the devil worked extremely hard to bring about disunity and disharmony in relationships in the kingdom of God. Yeah. But hey, he doesn't stop there. He brings about disharmony and disunity in relationships. Yeah. That's what he's about. You know, if he can separate us from one another, whoever one another represents, he has successfully accomplished an incredible evil thing in the earth. So we need to stand firm against the attempts to sabotage the unity that we do have. God blesses unity and oneness of heart. In relationships, we have to be flexible and prefer one another. We have to be flexible and prefer one another. And preferring one another is really represented by being submissive and subordinate to one another. And so there is a sense in which there are a whole lot of things that don't really matter. And it's okay for you to have an opinion that's different from someone else. And so that's good. And that's right. But there, is, there are some foundational truths that are non-negotiable. Can you say that? There are foundational truths that are non-negotiable. Please say that again. <laughs> Why say something simply when you can say it in a difficult way? And the fact is that there are foundational truths that we are connected to together, that we must never, ever, ever surrender. Ever surrender. And so much of that reality in terms of what those foundational truths are, they're clearly in the Word, and we need to hold fast to them lest we find ourselves drifting away. So they write to the church in Thessalonica as one collective voice, these three boys, revealing a spirit of unity amongst the leadership. Unity in relationship is vital if stability and progress is to be made. Without it, everything is undermined, even in a marriage. Even in a marriage. You know... I absolutely love Deborah with all my heart. But you know what? Sometimes we don't agree. Debbie is a strong woman. And I'm a weak man. <laughs> and that's true for all men. But the enemy will cause division even in a marriage. So guard unity. It is very precious to God. And that's why he wants us to be preferring of one another. And I'm learning as I grow up that there is a whole lot of things that don't really matter that it's all right to agree to. Yeah. There really is. Yeah. It's not that important. But there are some things we must never give up on. So Paul, uh, so the the so the Thessalonian church is in God the Father and in Jesus Christ. Paul says it's a family of believers that have gathered together, and Paul wants them to know their foundational root is in God and in Jesus. And when Christians move away from this place, they are in danger of straying too far away from the truth. So they're the foundational truths. We must never stray from them. Paul gives grace and peace in his opening words. These are gifts of blessings that we impart to one another. And we need to learn to be those who bring blessings 
to people, even people we don't like, even people that irritate us. We need to be those who bless and strengthen other people. Because it's always the person who knows is gifted with the responsibility to act. And so we know. So act. Do the right thing in the moments of your life. Bless those who persecute you. Paul wants this, this church to have grace and unmerited favour. Grace and peace to you. This is the hallmark of God. And I don't care what church you go to, whether it's a church, a hymn prayer sandwich, or whether it's a swinging chandelier group of Christians. If they don't have grace and peace, they don't have the hallmark of God yeah. in their lives. A church has to be built upon grace and peace because it is the hallmark of God. And if your home is not filled with grace and peace, you will know. And if your workplace is not, you will know. And if your heart is not, you will know. And God, Paul wants these Thessalonian Christians to be filled with grace and peace in order to be strengthened by the presence of God. Peace is the outcome of his presence of unity in the relationship that you are having with him. If you don't have peace, then someone else is controlling who you are. And we're told in the scripture that we are, we, we are, as it were, in prison to anything that controls us. It doesn't matter what it is. There's a whole million things that it could be. But we need to be those who recognise that God wants us to live in grace and peace. It's well-being. It's already come. It's part of the gifts that God gives. It's on the banqueting table. Peace is what comes when there is no turmoil or anxiety or war. So Paul says, we give thanks for you all. And if you're a part of this gathered community there in Thessalonica, and you receive this letter from them, this statement is going to bring you so much encouragement. He says, he says giving thanks for you all, Giving thanks for one another is very helpful in sustaining unity. Learning to give thanks daily for one another is very helpful in sustaining unity. It's hard to bless if you have hostility towards another person. And it's even harder to bless a person if you have hostility in your heart towards them to live in the spirit of blessing and affirming because it will challenge you at the core of who you are because God wants to manifest love through Christians and he's got no one else to do it with so he wants to use Christians and he's chosen you and me to be those ones And knowing that your leaders, because Paul says we think and we pray, for, knowing that your leaders are praying for you and thinking about you should be an incredible encouragement to you, to your well welfare, your spiritual welfare. It's an important part of covering the saints. And we need to be all active in covering the saints with God's blessings. I don't know how much time you spend thinking about the negative things that go on in your lives. I don't know how much time you spend thinking about the bad things that have happened to you. I don't know how much time you spend thinking about all the regrets that you have. I don't know how much time you think about all the failure that you've entered into. But let me tell you this, every time you go on that train journey, you invite the enemy to infiltrate the very existence of your identity. And what God wants to do is give us the capacity, as he has, 
to say no to those train journeys. And sometimes it's very hard to get on, to not get on the train. But brothers and sisters, let me tell you that it's better to not get on the train to nowhere. Better not to get on there. It won't help. And the yes but ands you need to put to death because they're not going to help. They're going to spoil. What we need to do is think on anything pure and holy and righteous and dwell on these things and hold people before God in an adhering way. If you find yourself moaning about people, stop and start blessing people. It will benefit you and bless them. Your emotions will change. If you talk about your problems all the time, they will spoil you. Don't do it. Fight that enemy with everything that's in you. We give thanks, he says, although they had to leave after three weeks. He says, we give thanks for you all the time. We have not forgotten you. And you know, one of the things about the prodigals is that they soon get forgotten. But we need to be a church that remembers the prodigals. And you need to be a Christian that needs to remember the prodigals in your family. Those that have known God and drifted away. You need to remember them before God. Don't forget them. He says, making mention of you then in our prayers. is simply saying the name of that person in your prayers before the throne of God. John and Philip and Lynn and Anthony and Kim. And just bring them before the Lord. You don't have to spend years praying for them. You just need to bring them before the Lord. Remind the Lord of who they are. It's the way of stirring your love towards those people. Constantly means to keep on doing it. And Paul says, what we, though we've had to leave you, we, we're not forgotten you. Daily we think about you. Daily we pray for you. We hold you before God. He was a good pastor. Often Paul is seen as not a particularly a, a, what you might call a good shepherd. He, he was always having a, a, a poke at people. But he was. He was a man filled with love. And he was covering them in, the, in his prayers. Pray with thanks is the way that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Pray with thanks. To pray effectively, Mark eleven twenty four. We need to believe and to ask with thanksgiving. Learning to give thanks for people. And the best way to start praying is to say thank you for. Can we try that? Thank you for. Let's try it again. Thank you for. Thank you for. And then just say for who? Thank you. It will position you before God in a positive way. I just need to say that as soon as you say thank you, if you are out of sorts with the Holy Spirit, he will tell you what's the problem when you say thank you. He will poke you <laughs> in a righteous way to, to relieve you from that burden. He will bring to mind, the Bible calls it conviction of sin, not condemnation, conviction. He will reveal to you. As soon as you say thank you, he reminds you. Because he will reveal, because he wants you to come into his presence without any hostility in your heart. He wants you to come with liberty and confidence, as John tells us, with courage and boldness, with, 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 with faith and conviction of knowing. Pray with thanks. Paul says, constantly bearing you in mind. They would spend much time in thought for this newly formed community. Paul is saying, we think on your testimony of faith and good works. He valued the strength he saw in them, their works of faith, their labour of love, their steadfastness of hope in Jesus. It fills us, says Paul, with great joy. And there is no greater joy than to see, as it were, your children bearing upon their lives all the good things that you've invested into them. And that's true for the natural as well as it's true for the spiritual. 
It's a wonderful thing to see. Uh, Liv has got a new boyfriend. He's a lovely boy. There's a lot of him. He's six foot seven. <laughs> and he's discovered my shed. And he's always down there making something for Olivia. And the other day, he made her a mallet. <laughs> a mallet. It's a hammer. A hammer. Now, what she's going to do with that a mallet, I do not know. But he engraved her name on it. <laughs> now, personally, I wouldn't give Olivia a <laughs> But he's still young. <laughs> Paul is saying we thank think of your testimony and your faith it fills you with a great sense of pleasure when you see your children bearing the fruit of your investment your labour of love is to serve others without reward some people want to be acknowledged all the time when they do things for others but that's not a labour of love that's just the vulnerability of their insecurity they need to be acknowledged and identified because they're being driven by a works orientated mentality. We don't need to do it so that they praise us. We don't need to do it so they pat us on the back. We need to do it because it's there to be done. We need to do it because it's right. It's right to love people in their pain and sadness. We don't need to do it because everyone says, what a good person you are. If you live your life controlled by that enemy, he will have you chasing your tail. He will have you running up ladders, climbing over roofs. You don't need that enemy in your life. But you do need to be proactive in serving others. So many Christians are worn out because they're looking for the approval of others that I'll never get. And they're exhausted. A labour of love is to do it. But to labour of love is to labour out of love, to do it freely, to rejoice and receive love because there is the opportunity to serve or to ease someone's pain. Steadfast of love, Paul is confident this body has got their eyes on God. And brothers and sisters, we need to know whether we have got our eyes on God because if we take our eyes off of God, we are in trouble. We must never move away from the foundational truth. And when we move away from our eyes on God, we move away from the foundational truths. We must keep our eyes on God. What must we do? Keep our eyes on God. Say it again, I like it. Keep our eyes on God. It fills me with joy that my children are growing in their love for God. <laughs> Freedom is what we want, is it not? Freedom. They've got their eyes on the grace to sustain them in their service to do God's will. They've got their eyes on God to sustain them in their service to do God's will. Listen, we can do nothing without him. So everything we try to do without him is a problem. But we can do all things, can you say all things? All things through him who strengthens us. How much of all things is not been able to be done? Why well, say something simply when you can say it in a confusing way? We don't need to worry about it. God, if we're doing it with God's strength, it will get done. No matter how high the hue is, no matter how deep the valley is, we will be able to accomplish in God because God is with us and we can do all things through him who strengthens us. So they've got their eyes on the grace of God to provide them what they need to be able to do what they need to do. All who hope in God will not be disappointed no matter what they face in life. Is that a promise that says you are going to have a carefree life? doesn't mean that. Does that mean that you're going to have such an easy life as a Christian, it's always going to work out right for you? It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that we won't suffer. It doesn't mean that we won't experience hardship. It doesn't mean that we won't go through trials. We will. 
but he's with us. Yeah. And Paul wants this Thessalonian church to know that God is with us. And if God is with us, who, who can be against yes. us? If he is for us, who can be against us? You know, those psalms that are filled with gracious revelations of God's companionship to David, who suffered incredibly along his journey. Our victory over trials and tribulation. Oh, it's time. It's, that's me introduction. <laughs> <laughs> our victory over trials and tribulations. This has a lot to do with our attitude in the trial. When we know that we are in the presence of God, we know we can do all things through him. Jesus lives now in the presence of God, the Father. Where does he live? In the presence of the Father. Not in our hearts. Jesus doesn't live in our hearts. The Holy Spirit lives in our hearts. Jesus lives in the presence of the Father. Jesus lives right now in the presence of the Father. The Holy Spirit lives in the inner man, the who you are, your spirit man. You are filled and equipped with the Holy Spirit. And that's the presence of God that dwells within you if you're a Christian and you put your trust in Jesus for salvation. It comes a foundational truth. If you put your trust in Jesus for salvation, yeah. then you will be saved. And your salvation is dependent upon the reality of the visitation of the Holy Spirit coming to live in your hearts to enable you to be strong, and strengthen in your inner man by the grace and the peace and the love of God to sustain you as you press in to your world, being delivered from those things that have encompassed your life in your history thus far. Amen. That's a foundational truth. Mm -hmm. Jesus lives in the presence of the Father, interceding for us, crying out to God. Jesus is still bringing your name to the Father, even as Paul brought the Thessalonian church name, that little band of ex-pagan Christians. Paul brought to the Father. Jesus is talking to the Father and saying your name. Richard and Naomi and Becca. Jesus is saying your name to the Father. Doesn't it make you feel good? Yes. Doesn't it make you feel like you're loved? Yeah. Doesn't it make you feel like you, it's, you're not on your own, but you say, well, what about this problem? And what about that problem? Mm. We're not, not going to have problems. We're not, not going to suffer. Mm. We're not. We're going to suffer. We're going to have hardship. It's going to be difficult sometimes. Sometimes the pain is going to be so great you won't want to get out of bed. I know those pains. But he's still calling our name to the Father. I'm sure he calls me Paulie. <laughs> Paulie. Because whenever I find myself here in the Lord and he wants me to listen, he says, Come, Paulie. God calls to the Father your name. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. I'm not going to rush this message. So I'll just carry on another time. God loves you. Don't listen to the liar. Don't listen to the pain. It's not true. It's not true. One day all of our questions will be answered. One day. Until then we trust it. I'm not sure he calls me big boy. <laughs> he might do. He <laughs> Brilliant, Paul. Thank you so much, man. Really, really, uh, just. I was just thinking the wonder, the word wonder just kept coming into my mind as he was speaking. The wonder of God's word 
and, and, and the wonder of his gospel, the wonder of his love for us, and the wonder of all of these things behind the words that we just see on the page. Um, and well, we just thank you for, for all of these, these young servants, these young Christians who didn't, probably didn't really, I wouldn't know, have known what they were doing, and yet they were able to hold this together because of you. Enough for, for, Paul, for, for Paul to be able to say to them, for your work produced by faith, your labour produced by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Lord, for that hope. What you give us, what you did for us on the cross, when that divine exchange happened, when we were able to come back, to find that way back yes. to relationship, to true relationship with the Father. Yes. Yeah, Father, we thank you for, for every person here uh, who, who's committed to changing lives, like these young people were in this early church, committed to bringing healing and wholeness to people who are broken. And that's pretty much all of us, isn't it? People who are broken, we're all broken. And we just thank you for, for your grace and your mercy and your love to us. Yeah, I'm looking forward, Lord, to a, a journey through this book. Uh, through.